If you'd like to follow this message in your Bibles, you can turn to Exodus chapter 3 and on the church website and also on the Bayside Church app, you'll find some message notes and some discussion questions too that you can do uh, in your own time, either with friends or in your connect group to go a little bit deeper in this message. By the way, this time last year was uh, our first weekend back into lockdown. Do you remember that? We went into lockdown, then we came out for a couple of weeks, and then we went back in for that seven-day one, uh, which ended in uh, November <laughs> from memory. So I thought I'd just share that, you know, just by way of perspective and uh, how wonderful it is to be back into freedom and enjoying life. Um, First Fruits Weekend, it is, and I'm not going to preach or teach about money. Mark Connor did that magnificently last weekend, so if you missed that message, encourage you to have a watch or a listen. It's on the website, uh, and Mark gave some really, really good practical wisdom on financial advice, so I encourage you to uh, check that message. The title of the message today is What's in a Name? And uh, as my text, and we're going to go to Exodus chapter 3 and look at the first few verses of that. So now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire It did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. I should just say here that the strange sight was the fact that the bush was not being consumed. Uh, A burning bush is not a strange sight in that part of the world. Uh, If you ever see the international weather forecast and you know that often the Middle East uh, tops 50 degrees, which is crazy. Uh, And so spontaneous combustion of bushes is a fairly common occurrence in that part of the world. But the bizarre thing is Moses is looking at this bush and he's going, this is fascinating. It's burning, but it's not being consumed. And so it gets his attention and he goes over to inspect what's going on. So picking it up at verse four, When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The next few verses, God talks about um, the suffering of Israel having gained his attention. And God says, now's the time to act, to set my people free. And good news, Moses, you're the one that is going to be the deliverer of my people, Israel, from slavery. Now, remember, 40 years before, Moses was all gung-ho. He was raring to go. He killed an Egyptian. He thought that he was God's man of uh, power for the hour, but he went about it all the wrong way. He spent the last 40 years being a shepherd, tending sheep in the desert. And now at age 80, God says, now you're ready. And Moses goes, no, I'm not. And in fact, the next few verses or the next couple of chapters is a rather amusing account of Moses giving God five reasons why he's got the wrong person. He comes up with these five excuses. And uh, the last of the excuses is basically, well, yeah, here I am, send somebody else. And so we see in the next few verses, the first couple of excuses. Verse 11, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And then excuse number two, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What then shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you. And we'll unpack that a little bit more in just a moment. 
I want to look today at what's in a name and explore a couple of points with this regard. So first of all, we're going to look at a person's name as their first point of contact or communication. And then secondly, a person's name reflects their reputation and or their nature and their character. So the first one of these is a person's name is the first point of communication. For us to fully communicate with other people and develop a bond, it's important that we know their name. It's been a, a bit of a goal for me at Bayside Church over the three decades of leadership. And in fact, my entire life as a pastor, I love people and I want to know their names and I do my very best to remember their names. And sometimes it takes a while, you know, you have to ask again, sorry, you know, forgotten your name, can you remind me? But once it's locked in there, it's in there. And to be able to remember the names of people, so you don't just have to call them brother or sister, you can actually call them by name and you know the names of their children as well. Uh, a number of years ago, Christy and I spent some time with uh, some indigenous people in the outback and one of the things I love about Indigenous people is that they're so different uh, to the way that we would look at things from a Western mindset. So when I meet someone, I want to know, what's your name? And my next question invariably is, what do you do for a living? So tell me about your job. Our Indigenous people, first question is the same, what's your name? The second question is, tell me about your family. They want to know about your community, your upbringing, and the group of people that you're a part of. And so here we see Moses at the burning bush, asking God, who shall I say has sent me? So let's just revisit those verses for a moment. Verse 13, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is your name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you. Can you imagine the conversation? So really, God, what is your name? Uh, I am. It reminds me a little bit of that old Abbott and Costello uh, skit. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, it'll be on YouTube just, or just Google it. Abbott and Costello, uh, who's on first? And it is very, very funny. And it's kind of this circular conversation of these two guys from many decades ago but it's a great skit and it's a little bit like that here God what's your name I am yeah I know who you are I know you are but what's your name I am and so I am that I am uh, Exodus 6 verses 2 to 3 God said to Moses I am the Lord I appeared to Abraham to Isaac to Jacob as God Almighty or El Shaddai but by my name the Lord or YHWH, as we'll look at in just a moment, I did not make myself know, fully known to them. In other words, what is happening here is that God is deciding to communicate in a whole new way with Moses. Uh, for the last 500 years, he's gone by the name of El Shaddai, a name that he has introduced himself to Abraham as and so I want us to go a little bit deeper here and examine exactly what's going on. And that brings me to the second point. A person's name reflects their reputation. As soon as we hear a person's name, it brings up emotions connected with their reputation, their character, their nature and their actions, either good or bad or, or indifferent. So if I say certain names to you, it will bring uh, to mind and uh, to heart a, a certain reaction from you. That might be a good one or it might be a bad one. So for example, if I say names like Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin, I presume that will have a negative reaction or response uh, from you. Whereas if I mention names like Nelson Mandela or Mother Teresa or Rob Buckingham, for example, <laughs> hopefully that brings up a positive response because a name communicates reputation. A person's name reflects their reputation, which is all about their character or their nature. So what do God's names reflect about his reputation and his character? We're going to look at three names of God. And the first of them is El Shaddai, which we've just read about in Exodus. 
and invariably it's translated as God Almighty. But can I say that is a very sanitized uh, translation of that name. And we're going to dig deeper and find out exactly what El Shaddai meant to the original hearers. You see, many times a translator will not translate a Hebrew word literally because of um, one of two reasons. Either the literal meaning of that Hebrew word will mean nothing to a Western mind, or as is in the case of uh, the word Shaddai, it would actually be offensive to a Western reader. And so I'm going to show you on the screen right now, this is the original pictograph for the word Shaddai. Uh, It looks like a D and a W. So what's going on here? Well, the thing that looks like a D is actually the picture of a tent door. And the meaning of this is to hang or to dangle uh, as the door is hung or dangles from the top of the tent. And then the second thing that looks like kind of an elongated W is actually a picture of your two front teeth. And it has a number of meanings. It can mean sharp or to press, as in chewing something. Um, But it also means two, because there's two teeth. And so this was also their picture for the number two. And so what we have here is a very interesting pictograph. Dangles two, or if you want to reverse that, two dangles. What's it referring to? Well, it's actually referring to a mother goat who has given birth to kids, and she wants to feed them. And so what dangles from her body is actually her udder, which is full of milk. And so this is the picture that God is revealing himself to the people of Israel as El Shaddai. Uh, It doesn't mean God Almighty. As I said before, that's the sanitized translation of that name. God is saying, this is what I will be for my people. I am the one of two dangles. And so it's an amusing picture, but it's also a very rich picture because that mother goat in her udder has all sufficiency to meet the need of her kid or her kids. They can come and suckle and they get nourished and replenished and fed and, and filled up by the nourishment of the mother. It's a magnificent picture that God is using here to say, this is who I will be for you. And so just as the goat provides nourishment to the kids through the milk, God nourishes his children and provides all of the necessities of life. El Shaddai then is a name that reveals God's reputation and his nature as the one who provides for people. We see that reflected in our text in Verse 8 of Exodus chapter 3, And I will come down to snatch Israel from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and wide land, to a land flowing with what? Milk and honey. Is that because that was going to be their diet from that point on? No. It's a wonderful metaphor that demonstrates that God is going to provide for his people. But it's a new day. And God wants to give his people a fresh revelation of his reputation, his nature, his character, a name that would carry them into the future. And so this strange revelation where God says to Moses, I am that I am. You tell them that I am has sent you. God, could we come up with a different name? No, and for good reason. And so what we do as we transliterate this phrase into English is that we take the first letter of each of those Hebrew words and in the English alphabet, they are Y-H-W-H. And so it's an unpronounceable name of God. In fact, my Jewish friends will not even write the name of God. They will write G-D as a sign of respect. But of course, we uh, Westerners, We have no such idea of that level of respect. We look at YHWH and go, it's unpronounceable, but we've got to be able to pronounce it. It's not right that we can't pronounce this. And so we take a couple of vowels, an A and an E, we whack them in there between YHWH and we come up with the name of Yahweh. Then in the 13th century, some monks wanted to work this into English from Latin 
and uh, they added the two vowels from Adonai into the whole thing and came up, came up with Yehovah or Jehovah. And so that isn't the name of God. Uh, sorry, Jehovah's Witnesses. It's not. It is an unpronounceable name. It's a little bit like back in the early 90s. Uh, you remember the, um, the rock star Prince? He decided in 1993 that he didn't want to go by the name Prince anymore. And so he came up with this symbol that we're putting on the screen for you right now. Uh, and he became known as the symbol. Uh, it was an unpronounceable name. And I've got to say, as a radio announcer at the time, as well as in our second year at Bayside Church, uh, that really did my head in and every other radio announcer because we had to play music from this guy who had an unpronounceable name. And so eventually, thankfully, Prince went back to simply being Prince. Yahweh was God's new name, announcing who and what God would be for his people from then on. It's a name that reflects God's reputation and his nature, what he would be for people. And so the first revelation of that that we see in Exodus chapter 3 is for a people who had been in slavery for 400 years. So what would those people need God to be for them? Why well, he'd need them to be, he'd, they'd need him to be their deliverer. And that's what he was sending Moses to, to be and to do, to deliver them, to set them free from slavery. And God is saying through the revelation of this name, that is who I will be for you. And then God progressively reveals himself to people from that time on as what they need him to be for them. And so we see through the rest of the Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures, what we refer to as the Old Testament, uh, we see successive Yahweh names for God. Uh, and so, for example, if you find yourself physically or mentally unwell, then you need Yahweh Rapha. Uh, that is, I am the one who will heal you. If you find yourself in the midst of a bit of a battle and you're having a tough time, well, you need Yahweh Nisi uh, as a revelation at the moment. I am the one who will give you victory. If you find yourself captive to certain habits that are sinful and or destructive to your life, then you need Yahweh M Kadesh. That is, I am the one who will sanctify you. If you find your mind is rattled and you're anxious and worried and overly concerned, then Yahweh Shalom, I am the one who will give peace. When you're all adrift in life and you really need some leadership and direction, God is Yahweh Rohi, I am the one who will be your shepherd. When you need someone to stand up for you because you need justice in this world, well, Yahweh Tzidkanu, I am the one who will be your righteousness. And when you're feeling alone in life, Yahweh Shama, I am the one who will be there for you. The wonderful thing here is that whatever situation you're facing in life, God will be the one that you need him to be. And invariably he will lead people to be a part of the answer, just as Moses was part of the answer for the people of Israel. All of these names reveal something precious about God's nature and his reputation. We see a similar revelation of God's nature through seven I am statements that Jesus made in the gospels. And this is one of the reasons why the religious leaders wanted to kill Jesus because he came along and he used the same name that God had used for Moses in the book of Exodus. Jesus turns up and goes, I'm Yahweh, I am. And so they wanted to kill him because he made himself out to be God, even though, of course, he was God in the flesh. And so he, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the true vine. And then, of course, ultimately, the revelation that God uh, that Jesus gives of the name of God as he talks about in John 17, 6, I have revealed your name. And what we find for the new covenant is a brand new name. 
God is not just uh, El Shaddai. He is not just Yahweh, but under the new covenant, God is Abba. We translate that as father and uh, it's a fascinating word, A-B-B-A, nothing to do with the pop group. Abba was an Aramaic name that little children would use of their father. And uh, you know in English how often when we, we talk about the noise or sound that a baby makes and we say goo goo gaga and then we get all ridiculous when we're talking to babies and we make all these funny noises and, and then we pinch their cheeks, you know, and all that kind of gobbledygook. And we know what we're doing because we're talking to a baby. But in the Middle East where uh, the Bible comes from, the word that babies made was not goo goo gaga, it was ababababababa. And so from there, gradually over time, it became its own word, Abba. And it was the word that a young child would use to address uh, their loving father. It was the closest we would have uh, in English would be something like daddy or papa. And so Jesus introduced the possibility through Abba of a personal, intimate relationship with a loving and kind father God They're just the same relationship that a young child would have with their loving father. And we can commune with our heavenly daddy because we know his name. And just like a good father, he will be to us all that we need. I want to pray for you right now. Heavenly father, you know every person that is listening to the sound of my voice right now and you know what they're facing in life. You are there for them. And Lord, I pray that as you see what concerns them, the various things that they're dealing with in life at the moment, I thank you that you are close, that you are there, present and intimate, and that you will provide all that they need, and particularly your presence to encourage, to comfort, to refresh and to build them up and to see them through into a large place. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And if you find yourself at the moment just kind of investigating Christianity and a relationship with God, can I encourage you on your journey? Keep investigating. Uh, Pray, pray simple prayers like, God, I don't even know if you're real or not, but if you are, please reveal yourself to me. And uh, that kind of level of honesty with God, God will never... Uh, overlook that kind of a prayer and he will demonstrate uh, that he is real and that he really, really loves you. And if we can help you on that journey, uh, there's a link in the chat feed right now that our host is popping in there. Uh, If you're watching on YouTube, you'll find a link in the body of the notes. Just click on there and uh, that'll connect you with one of our leaders and we'd love to send you a Bible and some information that can help you on your spiritual journey.